Hello, everybody. So, well, first time I introduce myself, I want to kind of thank myself too. So, <laughs> so, so I'm Johnny Wilson, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of, about cheetah predation dynamics. So the thing about cheetahs is uh, we've seen them all in National Geographic and Disney. Uh, they're about they're medium-sized predators, and uh, around 25 kilograms in the Kalari in South Africa, up to like 60 kilogram individuals that you get in the, uh, on the eastern part of South Africa, and those who've been in Kruger Park. Um, most of the cheetahs, they generally occur as solitary individuals, but um, quite often, obviously, a female a male or cubs is dependent on, the, on her, so the cubs might stay for a year without her, and the group size can swell to like five or six individuals, depending on how successful she is. And males, quite often, they form these coalitions, and the coalitions is much better in taking down bigger prey. And these coalitions are quite often, they most often sibling groups, but we've also seen where like an uh, unrelated male can even come into a coalition of already two males, and they go and hunt together. Um, so cheetahs used to be widespread across, South a uh, across Africa. Uh, in the non-forested areas right into um, Asia, like uh, Iran, where they still occur. But over the last few years, they've been centuries, really, they've been heavily persecuted. So that map on, the, um, on your left-hand side, uh, the red is the cheetah distribution about 100 years ago. And on your um, right-hand side, the red is the uh, distribution of the cheetahs right now. They do get still into Iran, but those populations are really weak. Because of this range contraction, obviously cheetahs, um, their populations has crashed and they are now being considered uh, vulnerable by the INCN. Uh, what is interesting about cheetahs is they seem to still thrive in these marginal areas that nobody re else really likes, like areas that are um, devoid of, or at least the surface water is rare. For example, Iran as well, the Kalahari Desert in um, the Southern Africa. Um, we know, obviously, cheetahs because they fast. Um, the, they, there's these videos all over National Geographic where they like uh, chase down a prey like in blistering speed and all ends up in dust. Um, so we know they fast, or do we? The reality is that um, the estimation of cheetah speed in the wild is actually pretty bad. There's one estimate being made in the late 1950s on a Disney movie, and they used the, the yeah, they used the uh, frames per second to estimate the speed that, that the cheetah would run. So um, the, there's a lot of estimates in captivity um, where they were running around the track or something, and they estimate the speed there. But we don't really know how fast they run in the wild. Are they just are they fast or they're just good in kicking up dust? <laughs> so, and this is where I wanted to get to. I wanted to figure out how fast do these cheetahs really run when they uh, go after prey. I thought the Kalahari Desert is actually a really good place to do. It's really open, like it's big sky, so the satellites and the GPS can really talk to one another. And um, especially on these riverbeds that have a pretty strong substrate, you can really like, I really think the cheetahs can get a good sp speed there after those spring buck. So we caught a few cheetahs. We put some high-resolution uh, accelerometers, on, uh, um, the GPSs onto them. And while we had the cheetahs, we thought, eh, well, it's kind of hard work to get the vet and everybody there. So we will also use the opportunity to do a bit of movement study. So we put some uh, three accelerometers on each cheetah because like battery power and space um, the memory space is always an issue, so um, accelerometers on the cheetahs that, that we're running at 30 hertz, each accelerometer takes about five days. Uh, the GPS has lasted about 10, 10 hours, and we also followed these cheetahs by, uh, on foot to, uh, to record what their, uh, their prey species, what, what they eat, and to figure out like, the exact track of the hunting dynamics. So heads up to Gus Mills and Margie. Uh, they were my heroes in the field, and they were just following these cheetahs. Each cheetah would be followed for two weeks, and they were for every day, 24 hours. They were just sitting with these cheetahs, following them, figuring out, uh, the pacing every one of the, um, of the chases to figure out what's going on there. Um, there's one of our accelerometers. Here's a cheetah with its 
like uh, if you guys have seen these cheetahs in the Kalari, sorry about that, Just mess up your photos. But um, this is a drop-off collar with um, with the, uh, the GPS, the accelerometers, and um, the obviously radio collar because the drop-off collar sometimes these cheetahs can just book it, and they they faster than us, so they actually really. Uh, yeah, they, it's pretty easy for them to get away for us. So we, when once this drop, collar drops off, you want to figure out where this Jira is. And here's me. So I finally, I at least this, I can't claim that I wrestled this Jira. It was every dose, but at least I saw my study animal. So, uh, like I said earlier, these Jiras are pretty good in getting away from you. I just can't run that far. So, and when they get away, and you guys know, this radio collars, they just they fail so often, uh, especially the, between the dunes, and then you need to get the trackers in. And here's Bux, he's a bushman, and he was just superb in tracking these animals down once we lost them. But sometimes, not even he gets it done. There was this one female that just like, she just ran for, I don't know what, but 30 kilometers overnight, and we actually had to get a helicopter out to get this female because the equipment on this Jira is really expensive. And um, and yeah, the battery power of the radio collar is only so long, so stressful times, but it was successful. Uh, and the cheetahs were were really cooperative during uh, the study. We recorded 30, 36 pursuits uh, over the time that we had our, uh, on these two weeks of I think we had nine cheetahs. Uh, those uh, we recorded. Seven prey species and the accelerometer data itself totaled about 899 seconds, which I thought was pretty good. Good. So switching back to the GPS data, we use Doppler to estimate the speed, and here you can see an estimate of speed over time. And actually, the cheetahs don't run that fast as we were like; they don't get that 70, 120 kilometers an hour in they. And it's just below 100, uh, 70 kilometers an hour, which was the fastest speed that we, that we saw. Um, and yeah, this is a lesson for people. Science don't wait for anybody. This is not me. This is a collaborator. Uh, this is actually a competitor. But uh, despite that, uh, they basically found almost the same thing. Um, that like I think the top speed here was I think 80 or 90 kilometers an hour. Interesting. The top speed was from a failed hunt, so um, this cheetah really at least tried hard um, before he failed, so poor guy. Um, just getting back to this, uh, my graph this time, uh, what, what you see here is this, like from around six seconds, there's a drop off in the speed as the, uh, towards the end of the hunt, and this drop off is a bit longer than what you see on this movie. It's just a cheetah catch a prey and like everything ends in dust and just in the one area. This is six, 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 seven seconds. So this is actually a real behavior that the cheetahs exhibit towards that end. And that, was, uh, that, that end of the hunt where the slowing down in speed happens, happens at the same time as the angular velocity of the prey increase. So what this suggests is at the, as the cheetah runs, uh, for, uh, starts running slower, it starts jinxing more, um, for mirroring the, um, the, move, the movements of the prey. And um, you also can see this. Uh, there's a uh, there's a quite a strong uh, effect of the prey species that the cheetahs were chasing. So, for example, if you look at like this was an ostrich chick that was that was being chased, and uh, this is this uh, the chick basically the, a ch a ch a ostrich chick is pretty slow. It's a small animal, and it just like it obviously uh, relies more on agility. To escape the cheetah, than for example something like a steenbok that would seem to be relying way more on speed, and right at the end it might, it might jinx, and hopefully it will get away for the cheetah, or it might miss, uh, un, uh, miss time its uh, its um, its turn and it gets caught. But you can see here, as you go from a big animal like a steenbok, medium-sized animal to a small animal, the speed of the chase rid, uh, uh, decrease. That's like a general trend compared with to where the um, tetrahosity of the tracks increase. So I'll get back to that in a moment, but this is where, where um, accelerometry became, pre became pretty useful for us. Um, so this is a track of dynamic acceleration over time, and the, the, what this dynamic acceleration is, is it's just this, the accelerometers I 
missed a few other talks, but if you guys have heard it, apologize. But it basically, it collects three, the data on three different axes, X, Y, and Z. And we smoothed this data. And um, this is basically just the smooth data where you can really see a rapid increase in the signatures as the, uh, as the, as the hunt initiates. And then you can, so the smooth data, you can subtract it from the raw data, you can, uh, and you can uh, uh, summarize these uh, vectorial sums. And the, like, obviously, it starts at 1, which is at, G, at G-force. And at this G-force, um, it's a G-force, um, and that is with constant acceleration. And as this, basically, this cheetah starts moving around, mirroring the prey, the movements of the prey right at the end of the hunt, you can really track how the body posture of the animal is uh, changing as we, as it's been followed, uh, or mirroring the evasive tactics of the prey. What you can do then is that uh, is that static acceleration that you saw in the previous graph, where, where the animal move, uh, where you can see the body posture changes. You can subtract, you can um, subtract the effect of g-force onto it to get the effect of both uh, lateral and forward acceleration on the animal. And what you see here is actually like during the entire hunt, the, um, the, the, this is a measure then of the uh, amount of force or energy that the animal uh, expends during the hunt. And you can see it's pretty, um, it's pretty constant over the time. And this is basically, so what this is telling us is that while the animal spent the energy going forward towards the animal with the acceleration phase, and then the, when they switch over to the, to the um, mi mirroring the prey movement phase, the energy that this animal expend is basically the same. And this is a reason for that. So it's actually quite costly or really hard to turn. And um, we all can, uh, they, uh, can really like to um, to, um, to how hard it is to turn. Basically, how many um, basketball players do we know that has good, good knees or rugby players with good um, hips? So, um, <coughs> yeah, luckily I'm on, on the mend now. So, um, uh, basically, this is um, not me. That's not the competitor. That's, a, uh, that's, a, um, that's another Wilson. It's like dominating this. <laughs> this is Rory Wilson, who's, uh, who's one of my close collaborators. And what they, they looked at um, human subjects and they were just measuring the using oxygen consumption over the angle of the turn to see how expensive it is for an animal to turn. And what they found is that it's actually um, the, a single 180 degree turn is the same amount of cost to an animal as basically walking six meters further. So this actually we at least have empirical data also that show how expensive turns is. And this is especially important for cheetahs, and a, pre a clever pre prey species can really exploit this. So again, we can relate, if you're driving fast in your car, you're not going to make that turn. If things are going to turn ugly. Or, um, yeah, so you need to slow down. And basically, what a cheetah does, when, or any predator really does while they're chasing the prey, is they would chase the prey, they'll try and get closer and closer to the prey species, and as soon as basically what happens is for the prey to escape is they will make a turn. And the faster the cheetah runs, the more the overshoot, uh, the basically the overshoot is, uh, the further the uh, cheetah, the predator will be away from the prey, the prey can kind of make an evasive tactic. And this cheetah basically needs to keep trying. So here you can see it's far away, it gets closer, closer, closer to the prey. The prey makes a turn. This is like a schematic presentation. The prey makes a turn, the cheetah is far away, and then it needs to get closer, closer, closer. And at some stage, either somebody is going to be, be exhausted by this cat and mouse game, or um, what might happen is the prey most likely will, make a, will mistime its turn, the cheetah will cut the corner, and the cheetah is close, and the prey is being caught. And we see, um, <coughs> and the prey is being caught. And we actually see this also by using the accelerometer data. We can, um, and this is a paper that we got in press, and I uh, hope nobody wants to ask me how to do this. This is Rory doing his magic. But basically what he did is he um, estimated from the accelerometer data, he estimated the angle at which the prey, uh, at which the, what the cheetah overshoots, assuming that the prey runs 90 degrees 
like that the overshoot, how far that is, and that by that overshoot or the angle, the distance that the prey, uh, the predator run towards the prey, you can estimate the distance between the predator and prey. And if you just focus on this bottom line, like if uh, basically uh, this gray, uh, um, uh, the gray solid lines, you can see as you get closer and closer and closer, faster and faster, the overshoot is bigger. But this is again where we come to this arch stretch that's slow and that the springbok or the gemsbok that's fast. Uh, this is a, the wildebeest, wildebeest is a pretty big animal. And what the big animal do is they're much faster so they can rely on speed to get away from the cheetah. So they try and run as fast as they possible. The cheetah always gets closer to the animal because, well, cheetah is not as fast as I would hope, was hoping it would, they would be. Oh, I was. I really look, look forward to that 100-kilometer GPS reading. Never happened. But uh, as they get closer and closer, this cheetah, the, the wildebeest basically make its turn. The cheetah, because they try to get closer to this much faster animal, the, 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 uh, the faster they are, the bigger the difference between the predator and prey. And then you can look at, for example, a steenbok or a rabbit, and the distance between the predator and prey is much closer to each other. Um, because of the, these small animals rely much more on agility to get away from the predator than prey, uh, than the big animals. Awesome, so that's my quick talk. And uh, I would just like to thank all these collaborators and funders who wouldn't have made this project without whom the project wouldn't have been possible. And thank you. Shall we go and have lunch? <laughs> or shall we questions? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. The ones in the east. So I don't really know what's going on in East Africa with the weights. I guess I could have looked, but um, yeah, from the east. The so the. The study by the uh, by the Wilson Alan Wilson at Royal Veterinary College they have been done in Botswana and they get almost the same kind of thing and anecdotally uh, Sarah Durant uh, is doing her work in East Africa and they also just don't see the speed so it's really like the, what it basically what we what I actually wrote is that in the um, biology letters papers is a cheetah just it's hard work to chase down a prey and get faster and faster and the cost is just if you turn uh, get that turn huge it just you you're going to you mess yourself up so it's just better you the cheetah run as fast as it has to be to catch a prey instead of like as fast as but with the possibility of capabilities awesome anybody yeah Um, I can calculate it. <laughs> uh, I have the data. I've actually not looked at that, but I should. So I'll kind of have a moving window and figure out where the fastest 100 meters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So a helicopter. A helicopter is fast. Like they get away from me all the time. So, yeah. yeah. I was wondering for say when they first did the return, do you notice that they were turning over in some of the dogs of the habitat that was better for them or the food? Or is it a left or right handed or left? That's a good question. So if you see we can actually just look at that at the uh, it's basically it ends at the same place, so um but it's almost like, yeah, um, that's one graph. I, it should be something interesting to look at. So, um, yeah, um, this chase, it doesn't look like there's really a difference, actually. But, yeah, that should be interesting. Cool, thanks. <laughs> okay. Oh. Blame him. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, yes. We originally started with a um, with a with a speed from the um, from the GPS, and I didn't look at the Doppler, and the variation is just too big, and like quite often the color would just swing a little bit, and it just I I trashed the speeds from the um, 
uh, for the um, geometric collect, uh, collected speeds because it just wasn't right. So yeah, awesome. Um, uh, can you get guys with other questions come and speak to me afterwards, and I'll not keep you any longer. Thank you.